Welcome to Easy Easy Bake Takes, Takes, the podcast, where we read you the one-star reviews of your favorite movies and more. My name's Kat. And I'm Riley, and we are continuing this week with our Pixar week, Mm -hmm. and I decided to choose the saddest movie ever, Up. The saddest cartoon movie ever. Saddest cartoon movie ever. Well, there's a lot. Yeah, you haven't seen your name yet. Yeah. I, okay, this is... The saddest Pixar movie ever. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's that one. accurate. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're doing Up this week, mm-hmm. which was made in 2009. I can't believe it's that old. I was 11. I remember seeing it in theaters. I remember sobbing my eyes out in theaters. This was in my era of, like, not crying. Oh, well, I couldn't help it with this one. This one this one destroyed me. I was the only dry eye in the house during Bridge to Terabithia, so... Monster. <laughs> Listen, I, was, I had a dry spell of tears. <laughs> Until I was 17. Okay. I, after we watched Bridge to Terabithia, we went to McDonald's and I cried so hard I fell asleep in the playset. Oh, <laughs> you poor thing. My foot was sticking outside the net and my aunt had to get a guy to poke my foot to wake me up. <laughs> <laughs> so this was made in 2009. It's rated PG. This is an hour and 36 minutes long. And then we'll go ahead again to the plot. As a young boy, 10-year-old Carl Fredrickson idolizes explorer Charles Muntz after he is accused of presenting a fake giant bird skeleton from Paradise Falls in South America. Muntz returns to the falls, intent on clearing his name by capturing a living specimen. Carl meets fellow Muntz fan Ellie, who confides her desire to move her clubhouse, an abandoned house in the neighborhood, to a cliff overlooking Paradise Falls. The two later marry and live in the rebuilt house with Carl working as a balloon salesman and Ellie a tour guide at the zoo. After Ellie suffers a miscarriage, she is declared infertile and the couple decide to refocus and begin saving for a trip to Paradise Falls. However, they are constantly forced to spend their savings on more urgent needs. Years pass and Carl decides to arrange the trip as a surprise for Ellie. On the day that Carl plans to tell Ellie, she falls ill and is hospitalized, dying soon after. Did it? <laughs> we watched this movie and i was like on tiktok later the amount of times people use that sound it is like still very relevant to this day yeah there was somebody who wrote lyrics to the the up song <gasps> oh i remember that i remember that that was really good so sad <laughs> After finishing this, the first 10 minutes of the movie, I was like, fuck you, Riley. Fuck you for making me watch this movie. (laughs) This is, I feel like, because there's so many good Pixar movies, but like, I love this one. It's hard to hate this movie. It's hard to hate this movie. Anyway, sometime later, Carl, now retired and in his late 70s, stubbornly holds out in the house while the neighborhood around him is replaced by skyscrapers. After Carl injures a construction worker during a mishap, the court deems him a public menace, requiring his relocation (laughs) to an assisted living facility. I want to be 70. Carl Fredericks, menace to society. I have not lived if I'm not in my 70s and declared a public menace. Life goals. Life goals. However, Carl resolves to keep Ellie's promise, turning his house into a makeshift airship using helium balloons and flying to Paradise Falls. Russell, an eight-year-old wilderness explorer who visits Carl in an effort to earn his final merit badge for assisting the elderly, becomes an accidental stowaway. Before Carl can land and send Russell home, they encounter a storm that propels the house to South America. The house lands on a mesa opposite of Paradise Falls. Carl and Russell harnesses up themselves to the still buoyant house and begin to walk it across the mesa, hoping to reach the falls before the balloons deflate. Russell encounters a giant, colorful, flightless bird whom he names Kevin. They then meet Doug, a golden retriever who wears a special collar with a device that translates his thoughts into English. He joins them on their trek despite Carl's objections. A pack of fierce dogs wearing the collars collars take Carl, Russell, and Doug to their master, the now elderly Charles Muntz. He invites them aboard his dirigible The Spirit of Adventure and talks about his search for the bird. Carl realizes Mont's obsession with finding the bird has driven him mad to the point of killing innocent travelers whom he suspected of seeking the bird for themselves. When Russell notes the skeleton's resemblance to Kevin, Mont sees them as thieves and becomes hostile. The dogs pursue Carl, Russell, and Doug until Kevin saves them. One of the pursuing dogs bites Kevin's leg as she flees, injuring her to the point where she can't stand on her own. They reach safety from the dogs. Russell urges Carl to help Kevin get home and reunite with her chick 
chicks and he agrees but then months who tracks the group down through dog's collar captures her he starts a fire beneath carl's house forcing him to choose whether to rescue it or kevin carl chooses his home at the falls carl looks through ellie's childhood scrapbook and discovers that she filled in the blank oh my god this is the point that kills me she filled in the blank pages with photos of their marriage accompanying a no written from written from her this? hospital bed i can do it <laughs> okay. from her hospital bed thanking him for the adventure and encouraging him to have a new one i'm sorry i didn't know <laughs> okay. I don't think I was gonna do this. Oh my god! Oh, give oh me a second. God. Oh my god! It's usually me. It's, it's, it's usually, usually me. you. This is why I picked the Sui. Oh my god! Oh my god! Your kryptonite. Oh my god! Do you want me to read? No, it? I got it. <laughs> okay. I have it reinvigorated he goes outside only to see russell set out after kevin using a leaf blower and some balloons to fly hello <laughs> 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 <A> zooey <laughs> <laughs> makes you ball and then that's something silly and like that happens <laughs> i love russell. love russell oh my god <laughs> carl lion lions his house by throwing out furniture and keepsakes allowing it to fly again months captures russell but carl and doug board the dirigible and free both him and kevin when months pursues them to the tethered house carl lures kevin back to the airship using a piece of chocolate months <laughs> leaves after them but his leg catches on blue strings and he falls to his death one of the oh my god like like one of the scariest i don't know how to describe it like one of the it's like the death of the evil queen in snow white yeah. it's just like gruesome there's a thing with like villains falling to their deaths a lot like mm -hmm. that is like a huge scar scar did technically the hyenas take care of him but he does like he does have a big fall that leads to him i haven't heard you say that in so long oh, did i say, oh i i always forget i say that word wrong and i don't know how to pronounce it any other way I know, I just haven't heard you say it in so long. I haven't been able to get you to say it. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, the house descends out of sight, at which point Carl decides to let it go and live on the dirigible with Russell and the pack of dogs. Carl and Russell reunite Kevin with her chicks before returning home in Muntz's airship. Russell receives his assisting the elderly badge, and Carl presents Russell with a grape soda bottle cap that Ellie gave to Carl when they first met, which he now dubs the Ellie badge. <laughs> I can't wait to get over with this episode. <laughs> you have you have one sentence left. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm to Carl. The house lands on the cliff beside Paradise Falls, fulfilling his promise to Ellie. Fucking Ellie badge, man. Oh my god. The last fucking punch of that movie. What a beautiful story of loss and loneliness and finding hope and letting go. Letting go and finding a new adventure and... Finding out you're not really alone in the world. No, and finding a new family too. Like, mm -hmm. oh my god. The amount of people that miss the point of this movie. We'll get to them. But holy shit, come on. Is there Was there anything about like, there's no way balloons could lift a house? <laughs> there is a comment that I put in there. Um, no, one, I, <laughs> no one from IND TV said anything about it well usually it'd be like this would never happen <laughs> there surprisingly well okay yeah there was some people were like oh it was unbelievable but like they, yeah. they really didn't get into like that like no one really was like hammering in this isn't you know yeah the directors were pete doctor and bob peterson mm -hmm. and the writers were pete doctor bob peterson and tom mccarthy if you guys don't know this pete doctor is the chief creative officer of pixar currently he wasn't at that time but mm -hmm. he currently is and he was on a lot of pixar films previous like he knows what he's doing he seems like a great person for the job especially like he's partially responsible for the direction that pixar is going now that makes a lot of sense that he worked on this movie oh yeah it, a lot of people put this as the turning point in pixar mm -hmm. so we have our cast edward asner plays carl Fredrickson. christopher Plummer plays charles Muntz. jordan naji plays Russell. Bob Peterson plays Doug and Alpha. Delroy Lindo plays Beta. Jerome Ramp plays Gamma. John Ratzenberger plays Construction Foreman Tom. If y'all don't know who John Ratzenberger is, he's voice in every Pixar movie. He's Ham from Toy Story. Mm -hmm. He's the Abominable Snowman Monsters, Inc. Mm -hmm. David K plays a news announcer. Oh my god. And then we have Ellie Doctor, Peter Doctor's daughter, who plays young Ellie. Oh my god, that's good. <laughs> I know. That's that one got me. I know. I know. <laughs> oh my god, that's 
That's so cute. And then Jeremy Larry plays young Carl. So now we have some trivia. Before the film's worldwide release date, Pixar granted a wish from 10 year old. Oh, I okay, prepare yourselves. Pixar granted a wish from 10 year old Colby Curran to see the film before she died. Colby had been diagnosed with cancer and was too sick to go to the theater. A Pixar employee flew to the Curran's house with a DVD of the finished film and screened it for her and her family. Curran died seven hours later at 9 20 p.m. shortly after seeing the film. Dude. I'm so sorry I started with it. Um, Dude, what the fuck? I know. It, it, I think it just shows. I think it just adds fuck? to this movie. It just adds to, like, this fucking movie, man. What the fuck? I love Pixar for that, though. Like, I love that they did that. I love Pixar for that. I hate you for it right now. <laughs> I understand, and I'm sorry. <laughs> we could keep going, though. Oh, my God. Okay. This one's less, this is not, there's not a whole, well, I'm not going to promise anything. This one's not. Yeah, don't, don't promise anything. <laughs> I'm not going to promise anything. The villain Charles Muntz has a similar name to Charles Mintz, the Universal Pictures <laughs> executive who in 1928 stole Walt Disney's production rights to his highly successful Oswald the Lucky Rabbit cartoon series. This led Walt Disney to create Mickey Mouse, who soon eclipsed Oswald in popularity. Don't you love when you become popular out of spite? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Someone steals something from you have you seen uh what oswald looks like no it's just rabbit mickey oh it just is him yeah, it is just with longer ears yeah wow co-director slash co-writer bob peterson say that doug's line i have just met you and i love you was inspired by a quote from a small child that he met when he was a camp counselor in the 1980s oh that's so cute i know it's so sweet i have just met you and i, and love, I love you, you. <laughs> That's so cute. It's so innocent and so sweet. Oh my god. When Carl and Ellie go picnicking, their destination is a spot under the same tree from A Bug's Life. I've never heard of that Easter egg before. Yeah, I didn't watch A Bug's Life a lot. Even a storyboard for the Mary Life sequence that opens the film brought members of the production team to tears. Yeah. Just thinking about it. <laughs> I can I'm understand. Like... Just thinking about it. I started tearing up. <laughs> I can't imagine having to, like, draw that. I would have been, like, crying while making it. <laughs> you just see, like, little tear stains on the paper. <laughs> <laughs> you just go, I'm so fucking good. <laughs> I love it. Pete Doctor, the director, provided most of Kevin's vocalizations. And I was trying to look for that, so I love it. Because I'm like, there has to be someone who, who, who made the bird noises for Kevin. When Kevin's making, like, the little cries for her baby. I know, it's so sad. I love how she, like, she says goodbye to each one. She, like, she cuddles Russell because she loves him. And then she, like, pats, almost bonks yeah. Carl on the head. And it just screams at Doug. <laughs> I love that. She has a goodbye for everyone. That's my favorite, like, little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Prepare yourself. <sighs> On May 26, 2009, Disney attached balloons to the roof of Edith Macefield's house in the Seattle neighborhood of Bollard, Washington. Edith fought building developers, and her little house still stands in the center of a large development known as the Bollard Blocks. However, development on the film began a full two years prior to the incidents in Washington, so any similarities are purely coincidental. It's the real life up house, and here's a picture of it. There's an LA Fitness right next to it. Why is that gonna make me cry? Because <laughs> it's kind of sad, and also if you want to read more about her, I highly recommend it. She had a very, very interesting life. She has passed, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't know if the house is still there. So that was the last of my trivia. Let's get into thoughts and opinions. Okay. I'll say my funny one first. Yes. Lie in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time a story about a lovable grump and his heartbreaking relationship with an Ellie made me cry, <laughs> I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened <laughs> twice. <laughs> Yes. Oh my God. And that's what we're going to talk about soon, too. We're going to bring that yes. one up. We're doing, yeah, we're going to do uh, The Last of Us in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just thought it was funny. I was like, here we go. Here we go again. Another fucking Ellie making me cry. Another Ellie. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Thank you. Thank you. It's based on the, the sound from Phineas and Ferb where Dupe and Schmertz is like, I <laughs> yes. had a nickel. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that's happened twice. <laughs> <laughs> And then I wrote down a line that Russell said. It was a really, like, heartfelt line, you know, just a kid saying how he feels. Because mm -hmm. his, ch his childhood is a little bit heartbreaking to hear about. Mm -hmm. But he says, I think the boring stuff is the stuff I remember the most. When he's talking about getting ice cream with his dad and just counting mm -hmm. red and blue cars. God, I'm about to fucking cry just talking about it. Yep. There's a lot of things in this movie. And I feel like a lot of times when you think of, uh, you think about Carl and Ellie mm -hmm. and you think about, like, his journey throughout the movie. I think as a kid, that's what I 
focused on more than like what Russell was going through. Mm -hmm. Watching it now, a little bit older, just hearing about like this kid who was really close with his dad and had like this really warm, close relationship with him. And then his dad got way more focused on business than his kid. It's heartbreaking. It's just as much about that as it is about Carl and Ellie. And when he says that quote, it's the little things or the boring things that I remember the most. That's just life. Especially being a kid. Yeah, exactly. Like it's the little things you remember the most and Mm -hmm. they're so important and that's what the whole movie Soul is about too. It's the little things in life that make it Mm -hmm. life and what make it good and you got to remember that. And like especially with kids he's a kid and you don't realize what a kid's going to remember like if you think back on your childhood there's probably a lot of mundane seeming things that impacted you a lot or that stuck with you a lot through that lens it's a super special little moment yeah there's a lot of really emotional journeys in this this movie and i love the messaging of this movie it's very classic pete doctor yeah I know we were talking about with Turning Red how it's a lot more of like an internal journey. And I guess like in watching this again, I would say there there is an internal journey happening in this one as well. Mm-hmm. But it seems like there's more of an aspect of an actual adventure mm-hmm. happening. The internal journey is externalized more mm-hmm. into the journey that they're going on physically. Whereas like in Turning Red, they were like going through this internal journey while life was just happening. Mm-hmm. And it did externalize itself, but it externalizes itself in a different way, if that makes sense. No, yeah, I agree. But but I am still mad at you for making me watch this movie. What's funny is like I was like debating on this one or the other ones. But then Austin, without even knowing what we were doing, goes, I want to watch Up. I was like, well, that's just the universe saying <laughs> we need to do Up. So sorry. Blame mm-hmm. Austin, not me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I I mean, I'm glad. I do love this movie. It holds up really well, aside from crying for half of it. It's funny. It's goofy. It is. It's the perfect amount of emotional and silly. And I don't know what could make somebody hate this, but there are parts where I could see maybe somebody not liking it as much. There's some parts like between meeting Charles Muntz and saving Kevin. The story between those two points is not the most interesting, in my opinion, where like it's a little too down and like sad. Yeah. And I'm not the biggest fan of that part of the movie. That's fair. It's not a big enough issue to where I would write the movie off. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say is that I love that they find ways to repurpose the same score in different ways throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. But what did you think of it? Is it the perfect movie? No, there's like a few things. Like you said, like, you know, in the middle might not be everyone's favorite, but I think it just has so much heart. I don't know. I just think it has just a wonderful message about life. Mm -hmm. You can have a wonderful life on the outside in. It looks like you didn't do a lot, but you did have an adventure. He he did. Mm -hmm. He had a wonderful life with Ellie and continued to have a wonderful life after. Yeah. You know, he had a learn that he had to figure that out but that's okay and that's what the point of life is and as sad as it is it's all happy Mm -hmm. ellie didn't die in vain or disappointed she loved her life she she was content and that's not anything to be sad about yeah they had a beautiful life together clearly like even when things got difficult or scary they still had each other and i think that's really a beautiful part of it but also i think this movie shows you that like your life can turn around and change at any point like it doesn't matter how old you are like life doesn't stop once you get to a certain age exactly exactly and i love that and i love that message and i love the story behind it and it's just wonderful Mm -hmm. uh you ready to move on to critic reviews yeah we're gonna do a review from richard propes so he starts with saying what is your life's greatest adventure have you traveled the world accomplished greatness in your chosen field perhaps maybe you have written a book acted in a play, sang with the Kennedy Center, or otherwise chased your dream, perhaps your greatest adventure is simpler. You worked hard your entire life, even if it seems you have little to show for it. You fell in love, got married, raised a family. Perhaps there was never a family. Perhaps you never have gone around to chasing your biggest dreams. You settled, or so it seems. You may have settled out of duty or necessity or unexpected contentment. If this seems an odd way to start a film review for Up, the latest animated feature from Disney Pixar, then you're obviously not familiar with Pixar cinematic history. I can't really blame you. After all, the film's trailer and much of the marketing campaign have painted up as a wondrous film about a cranky old fart on a magical voyage with an energetic yet inexperienced young boy scout who unexpectedly joins him on the adventure. Up is indeed a wondrous film, yet it is so much more than is revealed in this trailer and marketing campaign. Up is a sweet and funny, captivating and intelligent. Up is romantic. Oh yes, I said romantic. 
the first 10 minutes of Up contained what may very well be the finest romance ever captured in an animated feature. I was mesmerized. I was moved. So moved. I was misty-eyed and completely enthralled. That was the first 10 minutes. While this emotional center gave way to a slightly more traditional anime feature, the slowly evolving scene is constructed so magnificently that it builds a very human relationship with our two central characters, Carl Fetcherson and Young Russell. Regardless of how fantastic the rest of the film plays out, we've become so invested in the lives of Carl and Russell that we will, quite literally, follow them anywhere. The adventure that follows reveals one of Pixar Studios' major strengths in producing animated features. They trust their audience to truly get it. Seemingly regardless of who writes and directs, a Pixar film has become synonymous with filmmaking for children and families and doesn't insult children, doesn't believe that children must be constantly distracted, and perhaps most amazingly, trust children and families to be able to understand the emotions and experiences of everyday life. Very true. The reason that we liked these movies as kids, the reasons that we connected with them, because they didn't treat us like we couldn't handle it and they didn't, like, you know. Kids will get stuff way more than you think they will. Yeah. And I think they, he just puts it very eloquently. Mm-hmm. At a modest 89 minutes, Up is a rather short film for Pixar, yet once again it is perfect length. Co-directors Robert Peterson and Pete Docter don't pad the film with unnecessary dialogue, special effects, or other distractions. They simply tell the story, and we in turn watch it unfold naturally and beautifully. While it may sound as if Up mires itself in dark human emotions and serious themes, rest assured that it is visually enchanting and often quite quite funny. In particular, the characters of Kevin and Doug are arresting and joyous, and their scenes together brought out the child within me. The design of Paradise Falls, based on the real-life South American Angel Falls, is stunning and mesmerizing, while several of the scenes involving the airborne house are awesome and hypnotic, whether you see Up in 2D or 3D. There are really no scenes that scream out, see me in 3D, and Up is undoubtedly accessible to those unable to afford the extra few bucks to wear the glasses and get a few extra ahs. Mm Mm-hmm. Voice work throughout the cast is flawless, with a particularly strong leading trio of Ed Asner, Christopher Plummer, and newcomer Jordan Nagai, providing performance that balance humanity and humor, emotional resonance, and fantastic silliness. Tech credits are solid across the board, and Michael Giacchino's full-body yet never overwhelming original score is a perfect complement to the film's sweeping vistas, blending with touching intimacy. An emotional tour de force combined masterfully with dizzying imagery, heartfelt humor, and rich, authentic dialogue. Up is an absolute triumph for Pixar once again. Per usual, props puts it beautifully and highlights the best things about this movie yeah i'll move on to our negative review Mm. with the tagline pixar's latest is bursting with charming visual touches and life-affirming messages so why does it feel so cold it's by stephanie zacharek get a blanket stephanie (laughs) there are so many charming visual touches in pixar's up like the homey looking wood frame house that floats into the sky with the help of a thousand translucent candy color balloons that Frame by frame, the movie seems to be daring us not to fall in love with. The characters may not tug at our heartstrings outright, but they do surreptitiously plink away at them. Up is unapologetically life-affirming for those who like to have life affirmed, and from a technical standpoint, it certainly is beautifully executed. But save for a few inspired canine gags and a handful of very pretty visual details, Up left me cold. Its charms appear to have been applied with surgical precision. By the end, I felt expertly sutured, but not much else. I'm sure that's not the effect the film's director, Pete Docter, and Bob Peterson were going for. Docter co-directed Monsters, Inc. and was one of the writers for WALL-E. Peterson is a Pixar our vet who was one of the writers for Finding Nemo and who has also worked on the screenplay for Ratatouille. He's also the writer for Up. Everyone at Pixar from its writers and directors to its expert army of animators knows exactly what he or she is doing and in Up that shows too much. Up deals with adult ideas in ways that children can accept. It's all about dreams, deferred, the loss of loved ones, and the way disappointment sometimes reveal hidden opportunities for happiness. But as great as all that sounds, Up has the quality of a vacation package masquerading as a journey. Everything in it seems meticulously collaborated to get an effect out of us, to return to a supposedly desirable childlike state of innocence. Carl is cantankerous, not too cuddly, at least until the very end when you get when you get the payoff of seeing him transform into a carry caring human being. The music by Michael Giacchino has a forced airness as if in the imitation of Nino Rota, and we're treated to many, many shots of those floating polychrome balloons, even when they become semi-deflated, they're still at least vaguely hopeful looking. Universal symbols of the alleged supremacy of childhood in the world of Up, being too grown up is never a good thing. 
the vision of Carl and Ellie's marriage, which consists largely of their beaming at one another, holding hands and having picnics, even well into old age, looks more like a denture adhesive commercial than a real romantic partnership. But like so many of the Pixar movies, Up is rendered in broad brushstrokes of faux naivete that makes me uneasy. Up, like Wally and Cars before, it pretends to scoff at sentimentality when all it's really doing is dressing it up in self-awareness. I come away from most of the Pixar films, this one included, feeling that the filmmakers have taken too many of their cues from Charlie Chaplin and not enough from the drier, less needy Buster Keaton. Up is hardly an offensive picture at worst, it's simply innocuous, and at best, it's very, very pretty to look at. But there are those lighter-than-air balloons must support the groaning weight of a house. Up works hard to carry its vision of seemingly weightless innocence. This return to childhood comes with many, many strings attached. Um, they literally said it's about dreams deterred. Mm Mm-hmm. I don't think it's about saying that childhood is the only thing that, or like being childlike or striving for childhood and not being a grown up is what you should strive for. I think what the movie is telling you personally, Stephanie, (laughs) is not to be so fucking serious all the time. Yeah. And that just because you're a grown up doesn't mean that you can't fulfill dreams that you had as a child. It's not saying grown ups suck. I, it just sounds like you don't like kids' movies. <laughs> it just uh, even said like every Pixar movie, I just walk away going, hmm. It just sounds like you don't like Pixar movies. It's movies for kids. But I think with most Pixar movies, it's movies you watch as a kid and you learn these lessons and you carry them into adulthood and they serve as a reminder for you for when you get older. It's not to tell children being a grown up sucks. It's literally like you can be a grown up and still keep in touch with the childlike wonder that you once had. I hate when adults get offended when move kids movies are like, hey, keep your childlike wonder. I hate when they get offended over that because there's a lot of them. Being an adult does suck. It does. You should keep your childlike wonder. That's okay. Keeps you young. Keeps you young, but it also keeps you from being a jaded, pretentious adult. Literally, just like go slide down a slide. Go <laughs> sit on a swing. Your inner child's screaming right now. <laughs> yeah. But that wasn't, it wasn't terrible, you know? It wasn't a terrible shitting. They just sound sad. Like, they missed out on this movie, kind of. Yeah. This person reminds me of the Ratatouille critic. Oh, Anton Ego? Yeah. You need to eat your Ratatouille. Go eat some Ratatouille and come back. (laughs) Yeah, come back to me. This next one is also a negative review by Kaleem Aftab. It's written in 2009. And this is a Cannes review. For the first time, Cannes opened with an animated film, and the expectation was that Up would be a Pixar film to rank alongside Finding Nemo and Toy Story. This this proved a false hope. The first 3D feature film from Pixar follows Cars and Wally in taking a warm-hearted look at life on Earth before overdosing on sentimentality. Pixar, it seems, is turning into the new Steven Spielberg, expert at setting up worlds and plots, but unable to avoid saccharine endings, which stop good movies being great ones. A superb silent montage sequence as good as anything the cartoon outfit has ever done gives us a potted history of their life together until Ellie dies, leaving Carl a lonely 78-year-old widower. He decides that he owes it to his wife to finally go on a big adventure. Facing eviction from his marital home, Carl, with echoes of Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, turns his house into a flying machine using a children's balloons. The sequence is the only one that makes a full use of 3D in a picture that could easily be seen in 2D. Carl inadvertently takes a young do-gooder scout called Russell along for the ride. Before you can say around the world in 80 days, the unlikely friends arrive in a lost world of talking dogs and rare colorful birds in South America. Yet with the story perfectly set up for a classic adventure, the film quickly runs out of ideas and drowns in a series of sentimental cliches with months a terribly underdeveloped villain. Okay, I feel like the first, like the opening of this movie is like the, uh, you know, the Alan Rickman, Paul Rudd of this movie. (laughs) You can't deny that it's good. Yeah. I don't. Yes. (laughs) Yes, exactly. The first 10 minutes, no one can talk shit about. You can't. You can't. One, I don't remember that this movie was 3D. I don't either. Like, they keep mentioning that. And yeah, I don't remember that either. Two, I can kind of agree that Munz is a little bit of an underdeveloped villain. Yeah. I mean, I guess the whole point of it is like, you know, he like a don't meet your heroes situation or when you uh, you can chase a dream so hard that it becomes a detriment to yourself. And so I kind of get it there. But like in the scheme of the movie, like he is he's he's not very well established villain. So I can agree there. Very simple in why he's bad, 
Which, yeah. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, but, like, I agree there could have been, there could have been more. Yeah. I don't think it's a series of sentimental cliches, personally. I don't know. I honestly, like, I kind of wish they would give it a, a fucking example, if they're gonna call that, because I don't know what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. I've never seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I don't think it's that similar. Like, I've seen it. The car flies, but not with balloons. The car flies at the end of Greece. Yeah. I don't think that I would <laughs> yeah. compare them. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow. Up is just like Greece. <laughs> <laughs> that would be so fucking funny if they said that. <laughs> That's my official review of Up. It's just like Greece. It's just like Greece. Shot for shot almost. <laughs> yeah, they even have a point where they start singing about fixing cars. I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, this, I was right. This is a very pretentious review mm-hmm. because every kids movie we've done has had some fucking pretentious asshole write a review saying that it's unoriginal or that it's like cliche mm-hmm. or say it's too childish and it's a fucking kids movie. I think that is, I, I don't think there's anything more stupid to write about than that. Yeah. To go in a little, again, with the months saying uh, the villain, there actually was more in the beginning stages of the film, more detail yeah. about why months was the way he was. And there, there was a detail saying, if you eat the eggs that Kevin lays of that bird, oh, okay. it makes you live longer. So that's why he's still like alive. <laughs> See, that makes more sense, too. And I I figured it was something like that, because it always Mm -hmm. seems to be the case with kids' movies. It's like they had to cut something out. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, we lose a little bit of it. That's why the age difference between Carl and him are, like, they're, like, why are they the same age? He was a kid when... He was, like, 10 years. Yeah. He was, 10 years younger than him, I guess, technically. Yeah, because you could argue, like, he's 20 20 or 25 when he left. So, we like, yeah, like, he's 78. Okay, like, yeah, he's close to 100 or in his 90s. Yeah. But, like... Kind of like an Indiana Jones type character. He's probably yeah. stolen something from yeah. a temple somewhere that makes him more effervescent. Exactly. That was a big 10 fart sounds out of 10. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> go ahead. You go ahead. All right. So there's the next one. We're also bringing back some old friends. It's the Massey Twins. They wrote this in 2009. They give it a 9 out of 10. <laughs> oh, I love that. Keep that open because we need it. And they say, Pixar has once again crafted a truly magical journey through a fantastical land full of brightly colored creations and comical explorers. Playful humor and bouts of heartfelt poignancy combined with quite a bit of unexpected adventure to produce a film that will easily appeal to minds both young and old, and especially for those that have never forgotten the allure of chasing dreams. A perfect blend of visual designs and imaginative storytelling ensures that animated feature won't be forgotten by the time award season rolls around. With Pixar's unbelievable successful track record it's considerably more impressive watching their films continue to be of such a high caliber general appeal and repeat viewing sensibility up is one of the most enjoyable and entertaining of pixar's films one of the best the computer animated film genre has to offer with an unlikely set of heroes hopelessly romantic fantasy and suspenseful action a beautiful score and the completely outlandish unique plot the film magically captures the spirit of adventure wholeheartedly perhaps the most rewarding aspect of up as the most of Pixar's films, is a blend of lighthearted comedy with insight and sentiment. There's plenty of comic relief, but the heavier, growing old montage at the beginning, the layer meaningful fulfillment of dreams, and the ultimate sacrifices for grander causes create a deeper, satisfying re- resonance. The simple repetition of significant actions, such as tying a letter to a balloon, making promises by crossing the heart, or toying with a grape soda pin, and even the idiosyncratic straining of a bird figurine suggests heart-trending effectivity that further deepens the classical romance, which fuels Carl's motives for adventure. Up is a film with something for everyone and definitely worthy of multiple viewings. True. So true besties. Yeah, so true besties. (laughs) But uh, Up won the Oscar for Best Animated Feature and Best Original Score. I love that. All right, so we're going to start with our audience reviews. And this one's a 10 out of 10 from INDB. And the title is, I felt like a completely new person. Truly moving. They wrote this in 2010. Honestly, I found the DVD of this film in my house and decided to give it a watch as I had nothing better to do. Truth is, I really should have made the time before. Although I enjoy all the other Disney Pixar movies, I am at that teenage age where I mainly seek violence, sex, and gore. Thankfully, my teenage boredom <laughs> did me a big favor in helping what this fantastic masterpiece. This film was so fantastically deep, meaningful, and moving beyond relief. As soon as I switched it off, I rang my grandparents to tell them I love them. It should be made necessary that everyone everywhere should see this film, and I think the world would be a much better place. It really is that good. 
a hundred out of ten. You no, know, there is that like that point when you're a teenager where you're watching like you're like, how much can I rot my own brain? <laughs> I think it's a really sweet thought to be like, I think everybody should watch this movie. I think it's so cute that they called their grandparents right after it. Yeah, I thought it was a good one. It's kind of like a, especially at that age, it's kind of like a little bit of a reality check kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be so nihilistic all the time. I don't have to be a cool kid all the time. I can watch a Pixar movie and cry. Mm -hmm. This next one is a one out of 10 titled Overrated and a Disgrace to Pixar in 2009. Okay. I came into the movie with an open mind to the story and movie in general. I expected great things because Pixar has made some of the best anime movies ever. The only thing I actually enjoyed about the movie was the plot set up as the first five minutes of the movie were very <laughs> sentimental. However, this great setup was quickly overturned by the countless ideas that they were they were not appealing at all. I may have laughed only once in the entire movie as the humor could only be funny to small children. It saddens me that this movie could have been great, but I was clearly the wrong target audience. I do not recommend this movie to anyone over 10 years old, anyone with a good taste of humor, or anyone who wants to keep their opinion of Pixar intact. Up is nowhere near as good a movie as anything else Pixar has created because those other movies captured the eyes of a variety of audiences. I have no doubts that all the other fantastic reviews of this movie have been written by family-oriented people or Pixar employees. If they're going to pay somebody, it's the fucking critics. They're not paying people to go write fake IMDb reviews. Which I love. I love that they think like audience member reviews are someone's being paid for that. I love it. Yeah. Again, like I said, you can't deny that the intro of this movie isn't good. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly like you brought up. It's the (laughs) Alan Rickman of this movie. (laughs) Also, you're not better than anybody because you didn't laugh in this movie. You're not more of an adult because you didn't like the humor in this movie i i would rather hang out with somebody who can laugh at anything Mm -hmm. than somebody who is hard to make laugh y'all are miserable yeah (laughs) it's good it's good how's that not great how's that not fantastic (laughs) it's fucking fantastic that's such a good point i'd rather hang out with someone who can laugh at anything stupid Mm -hmm. maybe i'm just on the complete opposite spectrum as this person i'll chuckle at anything i'll cry at anything sorry i like i like things Three and a half stars on Letterbox. They wrote, Cute kitty fluff with excellent opening and score. Take those out and eh. Don't get me wrong, Doug is really funny and it's a nice little adventure, but it's not really thematically cohesive like Wally or Shrek 2. <laughs> if people could stop calling this the greatest Pixar movie based off the opening loan, that'd be great. And I think that's fair. Like I said, I feel like a lot of people, when they think of this movie, they think of the opening mm-hmm. and not much else. And that's not to say the rest of it isn't great and moving, mm-hmm. but obviously, Obviously, the opening was the most impactful part for people. It's the punch, yeah. Yeah, and they put it in at the beginning. You just open the door and they punch you in the face. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and then the Ellie badge is the last one to the gut. Jesus. <laughs> And I can't really disagree, like, that it's about it not being as thematically cohesive as other movies. Mm -hmm. But WALL-E is not really a movie I really go back and watch. Yeah. It's beautiful, and Mm -hmm. it's a very sweet movie. And hopeful ending. It has a hopeful ending, but Up is a little more low stakes, even though it's opening will murder you emotionally <laughs> yes so I, I can't disagree with them here but i think it's more than just the opening and the score mm-hmm. this next one's a one out of ten from imdb not for sensitive people this was written in 2009 for god's sake this was pure misery i'm still crying my eyes out the funny parts were very few while the miserable depressing parts were everywhere it took me days to get the poor old man's face out of my mind it was like a ghost haunting me the final message it was trying to convey was good, but with what cost? If you are sensitive and have grandparents you love or had grandparents you love, don't see it. If you are over 30 and don't want to see your life flash before your eyes, don't watch it. <laughs> if you don't want your children to spend the day thinking how they will lose you and everything they love someday, don't let them watch it. I understand that this movie is about loss, but it never really made me feel like I need to go hug a loved one after watching it. Yeah. This movie, what it made me think was life goes on. Life goes on. And I watched it as a kid. It didn't make me think, oh my God, my mom's going to die one day. Yeah. No, I had a hope for life, you know, like spend life at the most, you know? And I guess that's kind of what they're saying. Like, they do- they just didn't like the feeling of loss. Being reminded that that's going to happen, I guess. And I feel like that's a that's a you problem. That's a you problem. This is not that movie's fault. It, it literally the title is like, not for sensitive people. You're very, yeah. If you're <laughs> super sensitive, like you can't be reminded that death exists. Yeah, probably don't watch this movie then. 
I I understand if you're like sensitive and like you were saying like if you're this sensitive sure I'm a sensitive person this movie didn't affect me that hard yeah but again I feel like that's something that you, that's that you got to work on <laughs> that's a you problem that's definitely a you problem yeah but you know brave of you to admit it there you go <laughs> All right, so let's move on to the next one. This is five stars from Letterbox, and it says the first ten minutes are great for introducing children to the concept of sadness. <laughs> Which, yep, <laughs> good way to put it. Next one, five stars, Letterbox. I love drowning in Pixar tears. Mm -hmm. This next one's a one out of ten from INDB, the most overrated animation of all time. I can define Up as the stolen ninety minutes of my life. Actually, I had really high expectations about Up before watching it. However, it was so bad I barely finished the movie. I can say that the main characters are well created and written. Other than, on the other hand, there was no story in the movie except a little clip that tells Carl's life in the beginning. There was nothing good and original thing in the movie. It was full of the cliche dialogues and cheesy jokes. Also, the side characters were weak and poor. They had nothing to add to the story. However, I have to give it that clip I mentioned earlier was really awesome. I wish that the movie would be about Ellie and Carl trying to, trying to make their dreams come true together. I mean, that would have been an interesting movie, but I think this is that, also that's good. That's not the point. That's not the point, yeah. That's cool that you want that. That would be a very sweet movie. Mm -hmm. but that's the point of still showcasing their relationship and romance in the beginning to set you up for how profound of a loss that was for him. Mm-hmm. So this next one is five stars from Letterbox. Four. Oh, I can't count. It's I okay. can't read and count. <laughs> I didn't go to fucking school for math. <laughs> <laughs> this person said now i'm just imagining me in my 80s finally meeting my childhood idol paris hilton and her trying to kill me on top of a, of a plane backed by her army of chihuahuas <laughs> if that's not me at 80 i mean yeah like like i said this movie really also drives home the like don't meet your heroes message don't meet your heroes they it will be ruined mm -hmm. this is a one out of ten from indb called blah it's written in 2010 so this person said just here to cast a vote for those hating this film i would not have liked this as a kid either the whole beginning was so maudlin and weirdly seemed drawn out even as it went through 60 years maybe it's an insult to my intelligence such as it is that a boy and a girl who are pals would end up married how fake is that all that sentiment and sentiment blech at just before when he gets kicked out of his house i just decided to come and read the crappy reviews because I knew I was not one of the people who thought highly of this movie. I fast forwarded through a bit more of it then mercifully put it to rest. I'm not big on animation anyway and I hate this style of animation particularly. <laughs> But the movie was so applauded, I gave it a chance. Just awful. Um, I hate when people deem themselves like, this insulted my intelligence. I'm like, you're. I'm going to tell you right now. Nobody's looking at your intelligence. Take it down a few notches. I can tell you right now. Nobody's looking at you. No one's looking at you. No one gives a shit. I would get it if it were for like, I don't know, some stupid art house movie. Mm -hmm. But it's a children's movie. <laughs> It's a Pixar film. Yeah. It seems like you don't like cartoon movies for children. So I don't... I think you insulted your own intelligence by assuming that your mind could be changed. Mm -hmm. This is blah. Yeah. Two stars from Letterbox. I just don't like the old guy. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Okay. okay. All right. All right. Yeah. This next one's a one star review from INDB. Title is, in a word, depressing. Not recommended for children. Off a film about a sad old man who waits until his wife is dead to fulfill all their dreams and a sad little boy who just wants his dad back. <laughs> okay. Did you miss the part where he was about to take her on their dream trip? Yeah, exactly. And then she died. Because that's life and it happens and it sucks sometimes. And she died. She died. Anyway, continuing, or this person says, I definitely advise giving this a miss if you have children, unless you are looking for a way to bring up some difficult subjects such as loss and miscarriage. And that's just the start of the film. If you are, by all means, crack on. Just make British. sure you have your, yeah, <laughs> just make sure you have your talking points well prepared. You'll need them. Why not have, why not have the boy as an orphan come into their lives after the sadness of not being able to have their own children, then realizing that life was too short and setting off on their grand adventure, all three of them together. That could have been an inspirational story about not giving up on your dreams and finding the, that whilst the path might not be the one you imagine that you can still get there in the end. That's literally what they fucking do in the fucking movie. Oh my god. You just explained the movie. You just wanted it different. You just, you just wrote it kind of differently. Yeah. Here's the thing about the loss and miscarriage thing. I think the movie itself 
explains and handles it as much as it needs to be. They don't say the word miscarriage. They no. just There's implications. Exactly. And this movie doesn't bring it up in such a way where you're like, I don't know, I watched this as a kid and I didn't have any questions. No, exactly. This, this might be a little too deep of a question. Mm -hmm. When you were like 10, had you experienced loss at that point in your life? Uh, 10... No, not yet. I was 10. I hadn't had a family member who had passed yet. Mm -hmm. And you didn't come out of this with like questions about death? That feeling. Yeah. About um, n no, I remember. I mean, I was 11. No, like I understood yeah. that Ellie passed away. I understood yeah. Ellie couldn't have babies. I, I mean, I was 11. I yeah. no, there was no questions. I was at that age where like I understood what happened and it's not. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't something that you needed to ask your parents about. No, no, not at all. See, at this point in my life, I had experienced loss. I had lost family members at this point. And I'm sure there were kids who had questions. Yeah. They don't think that's something you necessarily need to worry about. It's not like this movie harps on it too much. Are you learned that... I learned that pretty young, like just through yeah. watching movies and stuff. When I was watching Land Before Time, you know, it was explained to me that Littlefoot's mom died. And it was sad. It was very sad. Think about fucking Bambi. Yeah, Bambi. Bambi is a prime example. The Lion King is a prime example yeah. that you can show your kids about, yeah, he died and it's sad and we're all sad. You tell them what they can handle. Exactly. And it doesn't have to be a big lecture or anything. No. Okay, this one irritates the crap out of me. It's a letterbox review that's two stars. It says, I guess it was okay. Didn't like that he gave away Ellie's bottle cap at all. He had nothing left of her and he just gave it away. <sighs> there's this there's this saying called don't don't keep the candles or something or mm -hmm. and it's like the the idea of like, you know, if like you kept all the birthday candles you ever blew out or you know, you you didn't you didn't eat the the chocolate someone got you as a gift because you wanted to hold on to the sentimental parts of it. Just be part of life, you know. You don't have to have something physical to have that person in your heart mm -hmm. and carry them around all the time. You still have the memory of them. Like I'm sure that's not the only thing of her he had. Like I know the house floated away. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's literally symbolizing letting her go. Yeah, and he still loves her. He's passing on her legacy. Yes. Like, he's doing what she told him to do in the scrapbook, have your own adventure, and he is. He has had, like, 60-whatever years mm -hmm. with it, and he had his life with her. Mm -hmm. And he wants he's to pass that down to Russell, yeah. He he loved it. In the way that she did to him. Yeah, exactly, like, exactly. He loved it, and he wants to give it to Russell. You know, yeah. like, it's, it's comments like this that makes you, like, you miss the entire point in the movie. Yeah. What I always think of with, like, the don't keep the candles thing is my sister got a gift from her godmother who passed away, mm -hmm. and it was, like, this little toy doll with a scooter that you could remote control. I always desperately wanted to play with that thing. Mm -hmm. so, did, so did my sister. But my mom didn't want to open it because she had passed away. The person gave it to you so you could play with it, not so you could just have it in a box memorialized up on a shelf forever. Because what is it then after, you know? Yeah. Besides just something in a box sitting on the shelf. It's just a dusty box now. No memories or feelings exactly. attached to it. Yeah. No hate to anybody who feels that way. It's just the outlook that I have is they gave it to you to use it. So mm -hmm. use it. Probably if Ellie was around in this movie, she probably would have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. She probably would have given him the pin. Yep. Exactly. Very well put. Thank you. This one's two stars from Letterbox, and it says, It's one of the most somber things I've ever seen. The plot is just too sad. There isn't even some kind of overarching happiness. It's just about a miserable old man stressing like crazy and almost dying several times in desperate hope to fulfill his dead wife's dream. In the end, he ends up losing his house with every memory he has of her. Every character is a sad, desperate charity case. Even his lifelong hero turns out to be a monster. Such a depressing movie, I cannot. I feel like this is what we were harping on just a second ago. Yeah, literally, it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But also, like, Ellie would have wanted him to still go. Ellie would have wanted him to still chase after that dream. She wanted him to move on, too. Yeah. It's not a slap in the face to the person who died. No. Because you're still alive. Mm -hmm. Don't act like they buried you that day, okay? They didn't. Keep living. And if they truly loved you, yeah. they would want you to move on. They would want you to go live life. Yeah. And if they were a piece of shit, do it out of spite. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm still kicking, bitch. <laughs> I lived. <laughs> I'll admit it is easier said than done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it obviously took Carl a few years. Yeah, yeah. To be able to do that. And a crazy story, <laughs> too. Yeah. Just to add on, like, you know, it's not like he's going to forget about her or stop missing her or stop 
you know, she's always in his heart. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. 10 out of 10, star from IMDb. One of the best movies ever made. It will put you through every emotion that a human can experience. That is, if, if you are an adult and not a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, truly. Yeah. So this next one's a 10 out of 10. This is our last one. Hands down, best anime movie ever. At first I thought it was born. And there's no G at the end, so they just said <laughs> first born. I thought it was born. <laughs> Not gonna lie, watching. You can just read it in your regular voice. It comes across. <laughs> I just want everyone to know, like, I'm not pronouncing it this way. I'm pronouncing this way on purpose because they wrote it this way. Not gonna lie, watching it as I grew older really changed my perspective. It hits your feels in the right places. The soundtrack is beyond beautiful. Just an honest review because this movie really ha was something special. As a kid, it seemed like a normal movie, but later, as you grow older, it changes a lot to how you see things and take things for granted. Life just isn't that long live yeah i thought that was a good ending yeah and i i totally agree that's that's how i feel about this movie as well mm -hmm. so what would you rate it hmm. yeah, i'm gonna give it like an eight out of ten out of ten okay i was gonna say nine out of ten okay it is it's definitely one that it's enjoyable every time you watch it mm -hmm. it's a great movie it's not the perfect pixar movie and i don't want to cry so i mean i like sad movies mm -hmm. but this one, I just... It's not an often watch. Yeah. And yeah, like I wouldn't say it's the perfect movie, but it's pretty close. In my opinion, it's pretty close. Yeah. And it's Pixar, so like... It's just naturally going to be up there. Yeah, it's going to move you in some way. Mm -hmm. Was there anything else you want to say? Uh, I think I, I... I feel like we said everything. Okay, same. So if you have any feedback for us or if you have any complaints or you want to suggest a movie to us, you can reach out to us on our Instagram at Easy Big Takes. We also have a TikTok at Easy Big Takes. You can check out our website, which has our transcripts for every episode and a review overviews. And that is EasyBigTakesPodcast.com. We also have a letterbox account, Easy Big Takes. Don't forget to like and follow and share us wherever you get your podcasts. And thank you so much for listening. My name's Kat. And I'm Riley. This has been Easy Big Takes. Easy watching out there. Bye. Bye.